Well, look who's the swinging party now. Hi, I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angle is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, I had a chance to catch some of the highlights and some of the reportage of the first night of the uh, two-night mega-democratic primary debate with uh, 10 candidates going at it on the first night and another 10 the next night. Um, the, the lead actors in the first night's performance were Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. How do I know that? Because the media told me that that's the way it would be before it ever happened. And guess what happened? That's the way it was. They were the they were predicted to be the most important by the mainstream media, and they were the most important according to the mainstream media. In any case, <laughs> every just, call I make turns out to be 100% accurate when right. I determine the outcome. Exactly. It's like when the pitcher is winding up, you go, this is going to be a strike. Steve Reich! <laughs> um, okay, so... The uh, What I mean by the swinging party is this idea that somehow uh, the Democrats are uh, riven deeply by ideological uh, differences. Um, about eight of the candidates on the stage uh, at this first round of debates were arguing for a kind of a more pragmatic Democratic party, one that can, uh, number one, get elected, number two, actually govern and get things done, and arguing against the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren wing of the party, which I will now call um, Elizabeth Bernie Sauron. Um, so the uh, <laughs> Sauron will be fine. Sauron for sure. Yeah, so I know what that eye, means. That their utopian socialism doesn't have a chance. So even if it sounds great and gets your blood flowing, uh, what difference does it make? Because you really can't govern that way. And frankly, uh, the Democratic base doesn't want it that way. But Stephen Green. Um, Conservatives seem to always argue that every, in fact, President Trump is pushing this idea that the Democratic base is going far left because of the squad and all this kind of stuff. Steve, are the so-called moderates on that stage correct and that uh, not only is America not ready for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's socialism, uh, but they couldn't even get the nomination within their own party? Wow. Uh, well, okay. Number one, I'm not making. I'm, I'm not the mainstream media, so I'm not going to make any predictions about who's going to win the nomination and then say, "Hey, look, I was right," because I don't actually get to pick the winner. So it's just you know the old Yogi Berra line: predictions are hard, especially about the future. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm staying away from. That's right. Steve from, doesn't from pick that. the winners. The super delegates do. Go That's ahead. That's right. Well, okay. Well, the super de delegates, their job is uh, if you're unfamiliar with them, they're, they're delegates who are not chosen by Democratic primary voters. They're, they're party insiders and, and donors and whatnot. Uh, the superdelegate's job is to step in and choose the nominee in case Democratic voters uh, uh, choose the wrong one. Right. <laughs> And, and there it, are no Republican superdelegates. That, is, that, is that not true? That, that is true. This, this, is in, uh, this is the Democrats. This is how they defend democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, the by, but, but well, by basically, uh, uh, Lenin would have called it the vanguard of the revolution. Essentially, yep. Um, what would McCartney have called it? No, go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it'd have a catchy tune, but just meaningless words. <laughs> it's um, got a backbeat. You can't lose it. Let me tell you what I thought was most interesting about last night. Uh, forget what the mainstream media told you you were going to see and then later told you that you had seen. And go to what uh, people were actually searching for during and after the debate. And it turned out the biggest Google searches were for John Delaney, who is, represents sort of the, uh, the the moderate wing of the party. He... he he came out in defense of uh, little things like private insurance last night. He's uh, if there's somebody He's left finished. in the party in the Bill Clinton mold, I'm, I think it's Delaney. And at the other end of the spectrum, the most searched for name last night was uh, the seer of dark psychic forces. Those were Marianne Williamson's actual words last night during the debate. First, first candidate in presidential debate history to use the Seinfeld yada 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 and refer to dark psychic forces. And she is so far out there. Um, she speaks the uh, modern language of uh, meaningless, feel-good mumbo-jumbo so fluidly and so fluently and so effortlessly that uh, on the demagogue scale, I think she scares me a little bit more than Bernie Sanders does. She's a very interesting case. I don't have any idea where she actually stands on anything because she she, she except for reparations yeah well except she was very clear on that 
Uh, but she speaks this sort of uh, uh, Oprah language better than, you know, that, that sort of soft, gentle, but meaningless psychobabble that uh, the daytime talk shows uh, revel in. She does that better than almost anybody. And Bill, you were saying before that it was uh, Mayor Pete uh, Buttigieg who scares you the most as a potential nominee. I got to tell you, I don't think she's got a chance in hell of getting the nomination, but you know, I could very well be wrong about that, but I think Marianne Williamson now uh, now might be my Pete Buttigieg. So, Bill Whittle, um, Elizabeth Warren said uh, something interesting during this debate, which I know you weren't expecting, but um, she did say something <laughs> interesting. Stopped clock, you know. That's right. <laughs> um, she was talking about how um, legislation in this country is written by multinational corporations for multinational corporations and that multinational corporations have no loyalty to America. And Bill, that almost seemed to me to be a conservative message that was saying America first. Uh, she sounded patriotic. She sounded like these big, um, you know, what's that term that they use? Uh, the, the, it's a... It, it's globalism to let these multinational corporations essentially steer the course of legislation through the American legislative branch. Are, do you think you can find some common ground with Betsy Warren there? And maybe uh, maybe that side of the party has a chance in the, in the nominating process? Let me make sure I understand this correctly. Elizabeth Warren is saying that, is saying that uh, there is no democracy as we understand it because um, – uh, multinational corporations control the legislation. And as a person who's responsible for the legislation, I would find that to be a remarkably interesting position to argue. If, if your argument is, is that the entire Senate and the House of Representatives is corrupt because everybody's bought out by these multinational corporations, and I'm a member of the, of the Senate, it, it seems uh, a little, um, little self-defeating to me and uh, but this is what you get when you have a party with that kind of a well, I think she would say ideological you, base. She would say enough of them have been bought up. Not her, certainly, certainly no, not no, Senator sir, no, Sanders, no, no. but enough no, no, of no. them have been have been purchased. You run against multinational corporations because it's a it's a, a gateway drug to uh, running against national corporations. Uh, it, it allows you to get all ginned up about about people making money and um, and they're not American companies so there are no American jobs on the line and it's a good way to get people lathered up and kind of test the waters for this whole sort of uh, you know what this whole corporation thing is is really kind of a bad idea um, I've been saying for six months now these people are on the reef and they can't get off it they're they're they just can't they're going and Donald Trump has been uh, I think very effective at um, at blowing that sail in the direction uh, he wants it to go. Uh, it's all about enthusiasm. I mean, it's, when we talk about voter turnout, it's not a question of whether or not people have the means to get to the polls. Maybe you could argue occasionally you know, a freak blizzard or something, but that's not what that's not wins, wins elections. What wins elections is enthusiasm. It's like it's either enthusiasm for your guy or enthusiasm uh, against the other person. And when when the Democratic Party is this fundamentally divided this early, in fact, have and have been since. See, two th I, I'm telling you guys. I've been saying this for a while now. When 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 um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez was elected in 2018, that was, in my opinion, the very biggest uh, influence on Donald Trump winning in in 2020, uh, because she's not smart enough to know that these are not conversations that you're supposed to have in public. These are conversations yeah. you're supposed to have on. Um, on either the Lolita Express or maybe out on Google Camp, which I'll be talking about on our on our things. But you don't say things like this in front of the American people. You don't tell the American people we want to get rid of jet travel to save the planet. They all believe it, and that's the plan. But you can't just tell them that because then then the American people beyond to watch actually believe, and that's the end of the Democratic Party as we know it. So they're stuck, Scott. And and so this is where logic is our friend as always. One of them, one of these two wings will win. It's either going to be a moderate or uh, when I say a moderate, I mean garden variety communist as opposed to, you know, 
Pol Pot kind of a uh, kind of kind of person. But basically, you're either going to have the, the centrist or the leftist win the election, uh, the nomination rather. And if you get the centrist, then all of the passion of the social justice warriors who think that Bernie Sanders is the guy who's going to basically destroy corporations and give them all of their money are not going to go out and vote for Joe Biden or somebody else who's kind of vanilla. And if, on the other hand, uh, one of these lunatics does get the nomination, there are going to be huge numbers of Democrats that are either going to say, look, I cannot vote for Donald Trump's, but uh, but there's no way I'm voting for this socialism. So I'm either going to sit it out or, or whatever the case may be. And on the other side of the equation, just briefly, I think Trump's position is far stronger with his with his uh, electorate than it was in 2016. So right now, oh, yeah. at this moment, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. So there's a, there's a process that perhaps is just the way it has to work, but I think it's kind of sad that a political party really only examines itself when it's out of office, so to speak, when it's not yeah, in so the true. White House. Good point. Um, and right now, the Democrats are going through this process. We didn't hear any of this when during the reelect President Obama campaign. Um, there's no introspection that happens at that time. The only thought is, let's get our guy back in the White House. But now that they're out of the White House, they've got to figure out who they are again. And they look at what happened in the past and they think, well, we can draw some lessons from that. Others say, ignore the past. Everything changes all the time. Nobody thought Donald Trump would get elected. If you'd looked at the past, you would never have expected that clown to get into the White House. But he did. And so right now, the, uh, the Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, the Sauron wing of the party... <laughs> is basically saying we need to be who we are and we need to boldly speak about systemic revolutionary reform of governance. And the moderate side of the party is saying you're going to scare away not only the Republicans and the independents, you're going to scare away more than half of your own base. And so this argument's going on. And frankly, I think it's a salutary process. I like to see the political parties examining who they are and kind of holding that up before the voters and saying, hey, is this what you want? Or is it this over here? Now, sadly, politicians will go whichever way they think that the, the crowd is going to go. You know, the process of leadership in politics is, uh, you know, watching the parade going down Main Street and running to get out ahead of it so that you can look like its leader. Um, <laughs> and, and that's how it's been going. But I will yeah, say man. this, from the perspective of conservatives or Republicans or 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 people who don't agree um, with these hard left uh, socialist type Democrats. Um, when you're speaking about this, I think it is more healthy to speak of it in terms of this is who they are. It's okay to label them as socialists as the president and others has done. But it also needs to be clear that I'm not talking to you, bread and butter, rank and file Democrat Party member. I'm not talking about you. Only 20% of the Democratic Party uh, sees itself as hard left. I want to woo you away from those people. I mm -hmm. want to show you who they are, not to damn you with them, but to show you that there's an opportunity to come away from them and make your party the party that you thought you joined when you joined years ago. And so if we can somehow strike that balance between calling out the socialism and the utopianism for what it is and the danger that it poses to this country, but at the same time, open that door and invite the people across the bridge to say, you know, you still have time to get away from that. And it's no betrayal to the Democratic Party to live up to the original ideals that you thought that you held. Yeah. Come. Come with us. We really are now the repository for those ideals of equal justice under law um, that you thought that you were clinging to. Your party has let go of that and has decided for a top-down, controlling, more fascistic, frankly, form of government. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible. 